thalamus' first appearance in phylogeny is as a brain region that controls a master gland, the pituitary. And it, the hypothalamus in the human still has that essential role. It controls hormonal release from both the anterior and posterior parts of the pituitary, both the non-neural and, and neural parts of the pituitary. We're not going to go through every single uh, uh, hormone that it controls, but I want to give you a flavor uh, by looking at, at four of these. Uh, uh, hormones involved in fluid, ba fluid balance, um, ADH. Growth and development, this is growth hormone. Uh, reacting to stress, this is ACTH. And lactation and maternal care, we'll look at oxytocin and prolactin. So um, this is, we're looking at the base of the brain. And right underneath the, the optic chiasm, here are, the, here are where the orbits, the roofs of the orbits. Here's where the optic nerves go out. Here's the optic chiasm. And just underneath that is the cella turcica, where the pituitary, um, uh, where the pituitary sits. And as you already know, when a pituitary adenoma grows, starts to occupy space, it will push up into the only place it has to push is towards the optic chiasm and cause a bitemporal hemianopia. There can be space occupying uh, pituitary tumors or simply secreting pituitary tumors. In either case, they, uh, th they have to be treated. Um, they used to be treated all by taking them out. Now sometimes they're radiofrequency lesioned. Um, but in any case, when they're taken out, there is some collateral damage for the, for the remaining, the healthy cells in the pituitary may also be damaged. So, uh, and, and one of the consequences of that is that a person may lose the antidiuretic hormone secreting cells or may lose sufficient uh, secretion of ADH. And in that case, so under normal circumstances, when blood osmolality increases, the uh, ADH is released, and that uh, signals that we now need to in concentrate the urine. This is a, a sign of, of dehydration. So now we're going to concentrate the urine and seek water. So this is, a, this is a typical hypothalamic response. Let's make this integrated behavioral response that's going to address the problem. Um, in the case when there is no, if there is no ADH, uh, typically because it has been damaged in some, by some, something such as a surgery, um, then the, the urine, it will always be dilute and the person will always be thirsty and they will always be drinking. Um, and they will always be going to the bathroom because they're drinking so much. So this is a form of diabetes. It's not diabetes mellitus. It's diabetes insipidus. And the difference there is that the, that the um, urine that comes out is insipid. It's, it's basically water. Whereas the urine that comes out in a person with a insulin problem, diabetes mellitus, the urine that comes out of that is sugary because the sugar is not being processed correctly. Okay, so this is a, uh, th this is luckily treatable. It's reversible. So if we can get ADH back into the system, then uh, this can go away. The second uh, uh, hormone that I want to touch on is growth hormone. And growth hormone has two different causes or, or two different effects depending on when this tumor or, or when this excess growth hormone uh, is secreted. If it's if too much growth hormone is secreted during development, what you get is something called gigantism. And this is a, a, a skull that we have in the University of Chicago collection of an individual who is a gigantic. This, this is, uh, uh, who, has gigant, who had gigantism. This is um, a, 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 a normal sized hand and what you can see is this jutting out bra, uh, chin, this very pronounced bra, brow the very large size. And these people can grow to be easily uh, seven feet uh, and, and taller. And it is, this is a very uh, devastating 
uh, disease and um, treatment is not uh, straightforward. There is a adult version of this which is called acromegaly and acromegaly um, the, uh, one of the people so this is this book by Mike Scalise called The Brand New Catastrophe a memoir is a, a fabulous book. I highly, highly recommend it. And he had, um, he had a bursting tumor, uh, um, which was overly secreting um, growth hormone. And, and there are, there's a lot in it about his experiences, and you'll learn a lot about acromegaly. Um, uh, I listened to it on, on a um, Audible. And I found, and he read it on Audible, and I found both the book and his narration spectacular. Highly recommended. Um, I just want to point this this out. So he, so once you have acromegaly, you have to be followed forever to to make sure that you're not going that the disease does not rear its head again. So after he had surgery, he then had radiofrequency lesion, and he has to be checked regularly, and he has to also take replacement hormones for the hormones that he is no longer secreting from his pituitary. Um, so uh, this is years into the process. He's basically, uh, he's on a good uh, maintenance uh, course. And he, he says this, I noticed a schism between her, his doctor's goals and mine as a patient. The doctor seemed concerned only with testing metrics and medications data, response, and remeasurement, whereas I lived in that body who reluctantly embodied all that data, sat in her office still very confused. I wanted answers and rulings, boundaries, and certainty. And, th and this was brought on by the fact that he is no longer making alpha MSH, um, uh, another one of these, um, another um, hormone that is released from the pituitary, and be as a consequence, he, he doesn't tan. He's always very, very white, uh, very white skin. And people notice it, he's so, he's so pale. Um, and she doesn't care about that because it's just not, it's not part of the medical problem of the disease. It's not gonna kill him. He doesn't, he doesn't tan. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't rate in her book. And, and this is a, a version of something that, that you'll see over and again, um, again and again, which is that what matters to patients and what matters to physicians are, are not are overlapping, but not completely overlapping. Okay. The the next um, hormone I want to consider is ACTH, which, as you know, is released from the pituitary and controls cortisol release, um, and, and, and which is very important for responding to stressful situations. And what is a stressful situation? A stressful situation is not a plus or a minus. It, it, it can be a good thing or a bad thing. Whatever it is, it's a new thing. It's a challenge. It means the body has to change. So in, in terms of stressors, marriage and death of a parent, they're pretty much on the same uh, level. It really doesn't matter whether you view this positively or negatively. Stressors are challenges, challenges to the body. You may be happy about it. You may be very sad about it. It doesn't matter. It's challenges to the body. So these are two different diseases that both uh, involve ACTH. In, um, in Addison's disease, a person does not make ACTH. In Cushing's, which is typically uh, reversible, it's typically due to uh, a the most common reason for Cushing syndrome is, uh, is, a, is a medication that can then be discontinued. But in Cushing's disease, you're, you're producing too much, uh, you're, you're releasing too much cortisol. So which one of these is, is a problem? Both of them are problems. This one, not only can it be reversed because it's usually, a, 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 or usually reversed because, it, because it's a medication problem, but this can be treated. This, this is survivable. It's a, it's, a, it's a hill in the road of life. Addison's is potentially lethal. People get in uh, to these Addison, Addisonian crises where they're faced with stressors that they cannot respond to. Uh, very famous, famously, 
John F. Kennedy, the uh, president, um, 35th maybe, uh, of the United States, um, had Addison's. He was, he, he, the, the, the severity of this illness was not known to the public at the time that he was president. But he, he was, a, at times, extremely sick man. All right. Um, so I think that that tells you a very essential truth, which is if you have to choose between too much or too little, you want too much. Uh, in, this, in this situation, too little, too little stress or too little ability to react to stress is, is potentially um, devastating and, and potentially lethal. All right, finally, let's talk for a moment about um, maternal care and lactation. So this is a, a picture I've shown you before of a, of a woman um, nursing her baby. And the, uh, the same hormone that allows for milk letdown in response to the baby's suckle is also responsible for putting this woman into a fairly calm state of mind. And if you think about it, here you are with this dependent being very close to you and for, for many, many minutes. And this is not a situation that we would tolerate normally, but we, but we well, we don't. Um, women who are nursing tolerate it. And it's because of this uh, of this um, hormonal environment. Now, every once in a while, the hormonal environment fails to uh, fa fails to be created in, in every woman, and so there are a group of postpartum mood disorders. And so these can be postpartum uh, anxiety, postpartum uh, psychosis, which is, gets a lot of press every time it happens. Um, uh, or every time it, it gets to an extreme. But any failure in this, in, in the release of hormones to support both the, both the let, letdown and the, um, uh, the accompanying mood uh, it, it is, is problematic. Um, and I just want to um, mention that one of the, one of the things that is, has been used with I think it's still, the jury's still out as to efficacy, but it is extremely, it's, it appears to be safe to give people, intra, give women intranasal oxytocin. And intranasal oxytocin appears to be, uh, um, in some hands or in, in some people's opinions anyway, is efficacious in counterbalancing these uh, postpartum mood disorders. So you can get uh, oxytocin uh, through an intranasal course, but you can also get it uh, pretty much for free <laughs> by looking into somebody, to another individual's eyes. And this is uh, work by Takafumi Kikasui uh, showing that uh, the longer a, a human and uh, that, that human's dog look at each other, the more oxytocin is released in both the dog and the human. So this is a, a you know, gaze into the eyes of your dogs. Uh, if your cats will let you, gaze into the eyes of your cats, um, and gaze into the eyes of your, of your um, children. Um, and, and I think that it's no mistake that she's looking at this baby, that this is a, one, this is a big way in which a maternal bond is made through gaze, because gaze is known to release oxytocin in the two partners that um, engage in in a, in, a um, in in looking into each other's eyes. Okay, so now we're going to go on to thermoregulation. <laughs>